Today we're going to learn how to import, process, interpret, and export data from Geolytics using an IDS Opera Duo ground penetrating radar system. Now this data set has been provided to us by our technology partners at Bigman Geophysics in Atlanta, Georgia. The project brief is that this data was collected over a regular grid in Chicago um, over a concrete or asphalt pavement where there is some suspected voids beneath the, uh, the pavement. Um, the plan is that they were going to place a crane on top of this uh, site and they want to know if there are any voids or potential voids. So within Geolytics, we've structured the project folders very much like Windows uh, Explorer. So there are directories or folders and then projects within those folders. Um, you can organize it geographically or by client. In this case, we'll create a new folder for this project and we'll call it um, uh, perhaps Bigman Chicago. And within that folder, we'll create a new project. And this project will be called Chicago Crane. And let's go ahead and choose equally spaced tracings. Within Geolytics, there are either GPS projects or equally spaced grid projects. And in this case, we were told that uh, there was no GPS associated with this project. It is an equally spaced grid. So we'll choose that one and say confirm. Now, when we take a look at our data that's being provided to us uh, for IDS systems, um, usually there's a data folder and there will be a whole bunch of files within there. And then on top of that is an SVY, a survey file. So what we want to do in Geolytics is capture everything. We grab all of it, or control A, and drag it all into the Geolytics window, just like that. Now what Geolytics is going to do is identify these files as being from IDS, and it's going to import all of them as quickly as possible. It's a parallel process. So of course the speed at which this gets imported is a function of your internet connection and the size of your project. Now what we'll notice here is sometimes there are some files that are simply not needed during the import. And Geolytics reports that as saying files not recognized. What really is happening is that they're not needed. The important part here is that we have green check marks behind uh, or beside each of the swaths. In the case of the IDS, we'll say close. Let's take a look at where these lines are situated. So we can see that it is a fairly regular grid. There's obviously been some obstructions on one side, so some of these vertical uh, lines uh, in the y direction weren't able to be completed. We see that the grid origin is down at the corner here, and within the IDS system, uh, you are able to declare where the grid origin is and the angle of the grid. So we do have some UTM coordinates that we can use here. Now, I happen to know that the city of Chicago sits in UTM zone 16T. You can look that up online. So we can go ahead and actually declare that within Geolytics. Um, and in so doing, we can place some background imagery. So if you already had a drone uh, image, for example, or, or, or uh, base maps or as-built or as-planned drawings, these can all be uploaded. Um, including high-resolution uh, drone imagery, as I said. In this case, we don't have any other information. We see that it's, it's actually kind of hard to see here. It's in a, in a dark shadow between two tall buildings. But the point is that we could have uh, a background satellite image. And there's a number of different satellite providers there, or upload your custom image. For now, I'll leave it as just white because it's easier to see. Let's go ahead and take a look at some of these profiles. Now, the IDS system is... Um, is a dual frequency system, which means that it's collecting data concurrently at 200 megahertz and 600 megahertz. Now, from experience, I would usually look at a lower frequency antenna when trying to find more general uh, features like voiding. Um, sometimes it's a bit of a forest for the trees situation where the 600 megahertz just simply shows too much detail. But we'll start off by looking at the 600 megahertz data. In Geolytics, we call the 600 and 200 megahertz uh, channels essentially variants. So we can see here that in Geolytics, we can simply flick between the two on the same profile, that's swath one, and we can go back and forth between 600 and 200. As I said, let's start off with the 600 megahertz. Now, the first thing we want to do with any GPR data is declare where time zero is. That is the first arrival of that transmit pulse to the receiver. 
everything else before it is something that we don't need. So essentially we're declaring where the ground surface is, and that is that black line. It's the first arrival. So that's a very simple process. We'll just go add new process, time manipulation, time zero correction. There's a number of different ways of doing that. The default is fine peak, and that generally works quite well. Let's now uh, apply a little bit of a gain factor here. I can't see much, so one of my favorite gains to use is the energy decay gain, which is somewhat similar to uh, an SEC gain, if you're familiar with sensors and software uh, products. Um, this at least maintains the relative amplitude of reflections, whereas an AGC destroys that and tries to equalize the gain and equalize the uh, reflection um, amplitudes. So we'll go ahead and apply an energy decay gain, and actually we'll ramp up the smoothing window so we see a little bit more detail. And the first thing we see is, wow, there, <laughs> literally wow, there's a lot of wow effect. So a wow is a low frequency inductive uh, effect that occurs in every radar system there. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter on manufacturer. It is somewhat a function of the site though, and the type of ground coupling that we see. So sometimes it could be worse, sometimes it's better uh, on depending on which radar you're using and the site you're using. But we do have a wow effect here, and we're going to get rid of that, I'm going add new process, filter, dewow. And what we want to do is select a wow um, sample window that's as high as possible without bringing back any of that white effect. So here we see, you know, I can move it up to the mid-30s and it should be okay. I don't see any of that whitening effect. But my energy decay doesn't seem to be working very well. And the reason for that is I haven't applied the energy decay to the wowed or dewowed data set. So the simple way of doing that is change the order. And in geolytics, that just means moving it down like that. And here it is. So now we see that, well, this is not going to be an easy data set to work with. We see that we have background noise kicking in already at 11, 12, 13 nanoseconds, uh, which is very, very early in the, um, in the time series. So the first thing we want to do is we talk about nanoseconds in the vertical uh, axis. Let's convert that to depth. To do that, we need to determine what the radar wave velocity is in, at the site. And a simple way of doing that, I'll zoom in here a little bit here, is to take one of these hyperbolas and see if we can match a uh, velocity to it. So it's a little hard to see, but if we go something like that, that seems to match most of them, or maybe a little bit tighter there. Yes, yeah, so we'll call it about just under uh, 0 0.095, which is typical for concrete and asphalt anyway. So now, instead of this view window showing a vertical axis of travel time, we can move that to depth. In fact, we'll close that window so it gives us a little bit more space to work with here. So now the first thing I see is that, wow, there's a lot of extra data here. There's just no penetration. It just makes life easier, in my opinion, if we trim that data down. So I'm going to go to time manipulation, time cut, and this is in the time domain. So we'll, we'll cut it down to about 30 nanoseconds. Great. Now we're starting to see some actual information that might be of use. But one of the things that we notice right away is that there's this horizontal banding. Now, horizontal banding occurs in radar data for a couple different reasons. The first one, particularly with shielded antennas, is that there is some reverberation within the shielding of the antenna itself. There's internal system noise, and that tends to be, uh, can manifest itself as horizontal banding. The other, concern, the other reason for horizontal banding could be the ground itself. Uh, depending on antenna coupling and the moisture of the ground, there can be some reverberation going on in the ground itself. In either event, um, it is distorting our signal and we'd like to get rid of it. There's a couple ways we can do that. We can do it first in the time domain. That's a little bit more complicated. A very simple way of doing it, though, is using a background subtraction. So we'll go ahead and add a new process, filter, background subtraction. Now, the default setting is about 100 traces. And sure enough, we can turn this on and off. We can see what the effect of that was. And it does clear things up quite a bit. So let's go through some of these profiles to understanding, uh, to have us understand exactly what we're seeing here. Okay, that, oh, I've switched to the 200 megahertz. Uh, let's go through it this way. Aha, okay, so already we have a problem here. This is obviously a manhole cover or some sort of metal 
on the surface, and what's happening is we see this smearing effect, this black, white, black, white pattern. What's happening is the radar energy is leaving the antenna, bouncing off the metal cover, and going back and forth and reverberating. But the effect it has with the background subtraction is that there's a bit of a smearing effect horizontally, which distorts the data to either side. We can fix that. Instead of doing a background subtraction just by taking the average trace um, over 99 traces, we can do the median trace, which essentially kicks out that high amplitude area. And now we have, yes, we have distortion right here, which we're going to have with the metal object, but everything else is much easier to see. You know, I still don't like uh, the amplitude of what we're seeing within this concrete and uh, uh, or asphalt area. We see some rebar here, of course. I'm going to add another gain here. I'm going to add a manual gain. I'm going to draw in something that might help me a little bit more. So just, oop, that's probably too much. I don't need to see that much noise. Um, I'm going to increase that gain at the surface a little bit more. Let me bring it back a bit. So I, I really don't want to show that much noise, but that gives me a little bit more information at that near surface in the first half meter, which is my region of interest. So the next thing that we want to look at, let's, let's take a couple more uh, looks at profiles here. We do see that there are some banding features, and that's probably within the concrete or within the asphalt. Now, I'm not actually interested in what's going on with the asphalt itself, I'm interested in anomalies within the asphalt. So a very simple way of highlighting specific discrete targets is to play with the number of traces in the background subtraction. Now take a look at this. If I wanted to really show those dipping uh, horizons, I suppose, within the asphalt, I would increase the number of my, um, my traces that I'm calculating and sure enough, yep, we can see those quite clearly, but that's not what I wanted. I really wanted to highlight anything anomalous. So I do the opposite. I use much less or le uh, much fewer traces, and now I can still see some of that banding, but now I'm seeing these targets. And these are interesting to me because they are um, quite discreet and uh, you know might be of interest. Let's take a, a look at a couple more of the, uh, the targets here. Uh, the profiles, and you know, there's areas like this that I, I wonder, well, why is there um, sort of an anomalous zone here, or some of these areas here, and of course this is our, our, um, our rebar area. So let's actually look at some slices here. To do that, we want to do a bit of migration. So the, the whole purpose of, purpose of migration is to collapse the energy from those hyperbolas into a single point. And, and the nice thing about doing this in the cloud is instead of running a process, we can actually use a slider and see what the results of the migration uh, algorithm is live. And usually something around 21 traces in this case seems to work. Anything more will over-migrate and we'll end up with a smiley face, so we don't want that. We want to be something like that, something like that. Yeah, so say 15 works pretty well. And of course, with slicing, we'd like to have everything as an absolute value or an envelope function. So we use the Hilbert transform, and that gives us our black blobs, which is what we're really after. So let's go ahead and do some slicing. So we go to slices. Now, our color scheme. I tend to use as, as wide a color scheme as possible, which is some sort of rainbow. Because everything now is a positive value, we've applied the Hilbert transform, we're going to mirror this. This allows our color scheme to use the full color, or the full um, bit depth of the original data here. So it goes from zero to, you know, whatever the maximum value is. Now, what are we actually uh, gridding here? Well, we want to grid the 600 megahertz because we haven't done anything with the 200 megahertz yet. And we'll use a creating algorithm. We don't need to do bidirectional. Bidirectional is used for utilities that might be perpendicular to each other or most commonly looking at rebar. In this case, we're not really looking at utilities. We're looking at a, a, a spatial anomaly if there is one here. So we don't need to do that. Our cell size, well, there's a number of discussions we can use on cell size. In this case, I'm going to use about 0.1 and a search radius of one meter. Of course, this is all translatable into inches and feet. Um, I'm going to use it uh, in, in meters. 
we'll use a depth increment of 0.1 and we'll go to a maximum depth of, well, there seems to be no reason to go past one meter because it's just no penetration. Now, slice thickness, what does that mean? Rather than take a single slice, we could take uh, what we would call a thick slice, um, which means that say we were doing a slice at 20 centimeters, but we had a 10 centimeter slice thickness, we're taking an average of the area between 15 centimeters and 25 centimeters centered on that 20 centimeter zone. So it does blur the data a little bit, but what I find is that it's easier to find discrete targets that way. And that's all we need to do. So what we're doing now is taking all of this data and processing it in the way that we prescribed as part of our processing regime. And then we're gathering all those data points and then gridding it and slicing it one by one. Oh, it's already done. Okay, um, well, let's take away that. Now, I've already made a mistake here. I should have clipped borders so I don't have that edge effect. So let's just do that again. Um, it'll go through it very quickly. Okay, so that's at the surface. Let's start going down. I guess this is our rebar area. We just don't have the, the line resolution. We don't have the line space closely enough to see that. Um, this is obviously our, I assume that's our manhole cover, I think. There might be another one there. It would be nice to have had uh, some imagery here. So there's some interesting information here, particularly you know, down here, this whole area seems to be a little bit brighter. And then, of course, we have some dark spots there. So this is really interesting. But what I'm going to do is do the exact same processing um, with the 200 megahertz. So I'll go back to my GPR profiles. Um, actually, I'll turn off the slice, select this first one, and go to 200 megahertz. And let's go ahead and process this one. So again, we want to do a time manipulation. We want to do a time zero correction. We will apply an energy decay gain, smooth it out a little bit. Um, oh, here we go with our dWOW requirement. Um, so I'm going to move that up to about there. I'll put my energy decay gain underneath it so it uh, applies to the dWOW. I have far too much data there, so I'm going to do my time cut, and I'll move it back to about, I think it was 30 nanoseconds I had. And again, I'm going to essentially apply the same thing. This was um, the median filter, and I brought it down to about 30, I think. So here we are again. We see our, our anomalies uh, come out quite nicely. There's some interesting features in there as I flick through. Um, of interest, maybe I'll, maybe I'll turn that gain, uh, the background up a little bit more. There we go. So let's go ahead and do a migration on this again. And I don't recall what I had, but it was about 17. It should be enough. Um, or maybe move it up a bit. And let's go ahead and add our Hilbert transform. So now what I want to do, right, so I've really subdued those, um, those rebar. Let's, let's actually add uh, another manual gain here just to accentuate that near surface a little bit more. Well, maybe not that much, but... I do want the black uh, blobs to really stick out. Um, okay, that's about it. So again, really, we're not getting much data beyond about 70 centimeters. There's no point slicing any deeper than that. So when I call this slices, let's just rename this as slices uh, 600, just so I can separate the two. Now, in this case, rather than doing slices, I want to try using a multi-slice. A multi-slice is actually an interesting way of looking at a site um, sort of holistically in terms of taking all the slices at once and highlighting where the anomalies are within each slice. So I'm going to try doing that. Um, again, it'll be a Krieging. We're at this time using the 200 megahertz cell size of, let's use the same parameters. Um, this time, I don't actually want to go from the surface because sometimes there's a surface effect. Let's start at 10 centimeters and really, oh, we'll go to one meter. Uh, that might be a bit optimistic of getting any actual data out of it. Now let's process these slices using the multi-slice tool. And um, this will be very quick uh, in geolytics, being able to gather all this data and, and process it. And what we hopefully will see is an error. Well, look at that. There we go. So we'll take this away. 
And now we have some interesting targets here. This highlights an area of interest right down here, another one here, but this whole area to the south is of interest. Now, does that mean it's a void? Probably not, maybe. It's nothing obvious. We didn't see any uh, significant hyperbolas there. And we can, of course, look at this all in 3D and bring back one of our profiles, for example, um, so we can see that in 3D um, and understand that, uh, let's see here, we'll go ahead and move our uh, bottom up a little bit. So, yep, that's, that's certainly where our, um, uh, that, that one target is, um, and we can do these ones here. So there's, there's lots of ways of looking at the data in 3D and interpreting it in 3D. But what we're interested in right now is this area down at the bottom. So I'll take away the 3D and just look at it from the top-down view. And of course, we can turn our satellite view back on. So to interpret this, I would certainly highlight the obvious targets here, but I suspect that they're, you know, manhole covers or something obvious on the surface. And then I would highlight this entire region at the bottom here as being somewhat anomalous, and if there was no other reason for it, and it should be homogeneous concrete or pavement, then that might be something to look at. Now, from, a, um, from an export uh, standpoint, very simply, we can export this as a KMZ file, and then place that in real-world coordinates. We can export all of this as DXF, as well as other uh, photographic outputs. So I hope this gives you a quick overview on how we uh, process and interpret uh, and particularly import IDS um, data from an Opera Duo system. Thank you very much.